African Americans were rare during the California Gold Rush. The notoriously inaccurate census of 1850 showed that the entire state of California was home to only 100 black people that year, although the number rose significantly to around 2,500 African Americans, including 90 women in 1852. Word had spread that no other place in the United States offered a quicker road to freedom for enslaved people or greater opportunities for free black people than California. Still, the figures remained low compared to other ethnic groups. By 1860, the census showed 5,400 African Americans in California. Although the California state constitution had an anti-slavery provision, this did not mean that Gold Rush California was a sanctuary for African Americans. Guarantees of black civil rights, social respect, dignified cultural acceptance, or even common courtesy did not follow. Slaves and free blacks were not welcome in the gold fields, as they represented unwanted economic competition, or more commonly, because most white miners refused to accept black miners as equals. In 1852, the California State Legislature passed a callous fugitive slave statute, modeled on the controversial federal law, that instantly threatened individual black freedom. Harassment was common, and African Americans were routinely segregated in lodging and dining. Despite the prejudice and restrictions, there were a number of black Americans who left indelible marks on the period before and during the gold rush. One of the earliest was James Beckworth. Son of a Revolutionary War officer and his slave mistress, Beckworth left his southern home to become a western mountain man in the 1820s. In 1829, he was captured by the Crow Indians and marked for death. Through his charm and guile, Beckworth convinced them that he was actually a Crow Indian himself, who had been kidnapped as a child by the Cheyenne. The ruse worked, and Beckworth escaped execution. Evidently, his story was very convincing, as Beckworth became chief of the Crow Nation just four years later. James Beckworth joined the California Gold Rush in its earliest days. He established trading posts in a settlement and is credited with opening a pass in the northern Sierra. Today the pass is called Beckworth Pass. James Williams was a fugitive slave who recounted his life story in this widely disseminated book shown here. He fled to the California gold fields as a refuge from slavery. One black man came before the gold rush and prospered, to say the least. His name was William Alexander Leidsdorf. He was the son of a Danish father and an African-Caribbean mother. He arrived in San Francisco in 1841, back when the little hamlet was still known as Yerba Buena. Almost immediately, Leidsdorf excelled in business. He built San Francisco's first hotel, constructed its first public school, owned the state's first steamship, and even conducted California's first horse race. He operated out of lavish headquarters, the Leidsdorf Building, one of the finest in the city. In 1844, Leidsdorf was granted 35,000 acres in the interior of Northern California. The grant was called Rancho Rios de los Americanos, which included the location of today's city of Folsom. Sadly, Leidsdorf died at age 36 in 1848, the first year of the gold rush. Joseph Folsom purchased his property for $75,000. But Leidsdorf family felt that his estate had been swindled, and they sued Joseph Folsom in 1850. The case was dismissed because blacks were not allowed to testify in court against whites. Today, the only lasting vestige of Leidsdorf legacy is a sign that designates the stretch of Highway 50 that passes through Folsom as the William Alexander Leidsdorf Memorial Highway. By early California practice, it usually took about $1,000 for a slave to buy freedom. In today's world, that would be about $31,000. This was not an inconsiderable sum. $1,000 was about four years' annual income in the 1850s. However, in the freewheeling economy of Gold Rush, California, that kind of cash could be realized with greater ease. In one case, a slave in California was allowed to keep part of the profits from a laundry his master ran in San Francisco. As the city boomed, so did the profits, 
and the slave was able to purchase his freedom in only five weeks. There were similar stories throughout the Sierra Nevada, for despite the pervasive and often dangerous bigotry that most African Americans face daily in the region, there was a slim avenue of escape. Consider the case of Alvin Coffey, an enslaved person who came to Sacramento from Missouri in 1849 with his master, known as Mr. Duval. Over the next eight months, Coffey earned his master $5,000, and working in the mines for himself on contract, by washing clothes for other miners, he realized an additional $700 on his own. Duval arrived in the gold country physically ill and grew progressively worse. Eventually, he returned to Missouri with Coffey and sold him to a man named Nelson Tyndall. Tyndall told Coffey he was too smart to be a slave and urged him to purchase his freedom. Coffey, who longed to return to California, informed Tyndall that if permitted to revisit the Golden State, he could easily earn enough money to buy his freedom. Nelson Tyndall agreed to the plan, and within a few weeks of arrival, Coffey had earned $1,500 and bought his freedom from Tyndall. He then raised enough funds to purchase the freedom of his wife and daughters, who were the slaves of a Dr. Bassett in Missouri. The family was reunited in California. In all, Coffey had raised and spent more than $7,000 to gain his and his family's freedom. In today's money, that would total about $200,000. These are the manumission papers for William Sugg, a native of Raleigh, North Carolina, who arrived in California as a slave. Manumission is the legal term for the process of freeing a slave. It is not known how long Sugg was enslaved in California before his manumission papers were filed in the Tuolumne County Recorder's Office on June 12, 1854. The often lawless society of California was becoming a beacon of opportunity for African Americans. In those days, no other place in the United States offered a quicker road to freedom for slaves than California. Frederick Douglass, the prominent African American abolitionist leader, even urged the American Colonization Society to abandon its idea of repatriating newly freed slaves to Africa and instead resettle them in California. In 1851, shortly after the passage of the National Fugitive Slave Law, the New Bedford, Massachusetts newspaper called The Mercury urged its black readers to seek refuge in California. Among those who heeded the call was Jeremiah Burke Sanderson, a religious minister from New Bedford. Sanderson came west expressly to teach black children who had no schools. He opened the first African-American schools in San Francisco, Oakland, Sacramento, and Stockton. In 1855, he opened a school for 30 black children in Sacramento, saying, quote, They must no longer be neglected, left to grow up in ignorance. Unquote. Perhaps the most famous Gold Rush era freedom fighter was Mary Ellen Pleasant, a Georgia born slave who arrived in San Francisco in 1849. She soon gained her freedom and opened a series of businesses. Some were brothels. In 1858, she gave the legendary abolitionist John Brown $30,000 to finance his ill-fated raid on the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. $30,000 in today's money would be about $900,000. Pleasant fought tirelessly to gain blacks the right to testify in California courts, finally winning in 1863. In 1864, Pleasant filed a suit against a streetcar company that mistreated her. She won the case. Grafton Tyler Brown was a noted painter and illustrator who crafted some of the earliest depictions of Yosemite Valley. He came to California during the early days of the gold rush and worked as an illustrator for the firm of Kekel and Dressel. Grafton Tyler Brown became well known for his so-called bird's eye views of the Sierra Nevada and gold country communities. This is his representation of Virginia City.